Well, good Sunday morning to you. I am so glad you tuned in. Let's just jump right on in and see what's going on here. Good morning, Fireplace. Hope you're doing well from your homes and with your families. We're really excited to join you guys uh, this morning as we worship the Lord together. Um, David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And listen, something that I uh, have come to know and come to learn during this season is that the house of the Lord is not limited to uh, the four walls of this church building. Um, so when it says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. How many of you guys know that, man, the presence of Jesus lives within every single believer um, and scripture also says where two or three are gathered, um, he is there in, in their midst, in their presence. Man, what an, an, a blessing, what an honor it is to be able to house the presence of the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings for those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, so as a family, I would invite you guys to go ahead and stand to your feet wherever you are. Um, and even uh, if you, like I said this last week, but if you want to just move some chairs around, move some tables around, um, whatever you want to do so you can kind of dance around, have some fun in the presence of the Lord, it's going to be a great time here. Um, so so I'm going to pray and we're going to jump in. Jesus, we thank you so much, Lord, for who you are. Lord, thank you so much, God, for your presence, God. I thank you, Lord, that you saw fit, Lord, to make our homes, make your home in us, God. Make our hearts your home, Jesus. God, so we just say what an honor it is, Lord, to be able to house the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, God, within us, Lord. Lord, so we, as we sing and as we pray, as we uh, jump around, as we worship, as we clap our hands, Father God, may you be pleased with our worship. God, may you, God, take all the glory and all the honor. God, we thank you so much, Lord, that we, um, man, your word says, Father God, that um, we would not, David said that he would not find rest for his eyes, God, or slumber, Father God, um, until he found a, a place for the presence of the Lord. God, now we can rest in your presence, God. We can rest in your presence, Jesus. And so, Lord, have your way in this place, God. Have your way in each of our homes, Lord. We love you and we thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty, the earth is Filled with his glory, holy is the Lord, God Almighty. All the earth is filled with his glory, all the earth is filled with his glory, all the earth is filled with his glory. Yeah. We stand and lift up our hands. For the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. How great, how great, how awesome is He. Yeah, how great, how awesome is He. Together, together we
turn it for good you turn it for good come on you take 
You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Come on, sing that again. You take what the enemy You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant. Hey, you take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. And you turn it for good. Come on, one more time in your home, declare this. And you take what the enemy meant for evil. And you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Take what the enemy meant. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Amen. 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 Last time. for us and because you are for us God nothing can be against us God and nothing can separate us from your love God nothing can pull us away God from the love that is in Christ Jesus God so I pray Lord that um, as we continue on throughout the service God that this truth would remain in our hearts God Lord that you take what the enemy has meant for you oh God and you turn it for our good God, and that all things work together for the good of those who are in you and who love you, Jesus. God, so we love you, we praise you, and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody, and happy Sunday. This morning, I want to remind you guys about our B groups that are still going on, and as always, there is still time for you to get involved. They're all meeting virtually, so there's a women's group, a men's group, a couch to 5k group, and a virtual board game group, which I've heard is a lot of fun. So if you have not gotten plugged in yet, but you are still searching for a little bit of community during this time, please go ahead and head over to fireplacechurch.com and click on the B groups tab and it will have all of the information that you need. And parents, don't forget that there is a PDF to help your, your children follow along on Sunday morning with our kids message. So if you want to go ahead and go to fireplacechurch.com and click on the kids ministry tab or check your email and you will be able to access that PDF so that you can print it out and get your kids involved. This morning I want to remind you guys again how to give. I know you've heard me say this every Sunday since we've been in quarantine, but if you want to give online, you can go over to fireplacechurch.com and click on the giving tab. And then you can click on the other give now button that is on that page and it will take you to our online giving portal. There you can give one time as a guest with an existing account or you can create an account so that you can give online. And as always, you can still send us a check to Fireplace if you choose to give in that manner at 416 Allegheny Street in Blacksburg. And I want to read you guys from Luke chapter 12, verses 33 through 34. And it says, sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I know that I personally can tend to fall into the trap of thinking if I just had X amount of money, everything in my life would solve itself and everything would be good. 
Um, I, I often fall back into this poverty mindset because of times in my life where I have been challenged in finances, but I also am aware that that mindset, that thought process never gets me anywhere. The only thing that has gotten me anywhere in regard to that is by choosing to trust God with my finances and let Him have control over them and decide how things should go. And then I finally feel a little bit of relief. Society so often tells us that all we need to do is work to be rich. Now, having money is not bad. You need it. You do have to have money to survive. But having a, an unhealthy attitude toward money and a crippling desire to just get more and more and more and feeling like you will never have enough is actually really unhealthy for you and can create some bad mindsets and put you into some bad places. So this morning, I just want to remind you guys that after this life on earth ends, everything that we have here is going to pass away. And when we get to heaven, the only things that are going to matter are the treasures that we have stored up there. So the attitude of our hearts, how we hold on to hurts, and how we choose to give to further the kingdom of God are the only things that are going to mean anything to us once we make it to heaven. So may we all have a kingdom mindset about everything in life, but specifically right now about giving back to God. So Father, this morning, I just thank you, God, that as we choose to serve you, as we choose to give to you, we are storing up treasures in heaven. God, that when we meet you face to face, you are going to speak to us again about our heart. You're going to applaud us and praise us for serving you. God, and for choosing you. And then we're just going to get to spend forever in your presence. So this morning, God, as we choose to give, Lord, would, would you help us align our hearts with the heavens? God, align our hearts with your kingdom. God, and you would use our offering, Father, so that we can see all the people that are blessed and saved by what we choose to give when we come meet you one day. Lord, I pray that you will bless us in this time. God, you will reward our faithfulness. God, you, you say that you will always reward our faithfulness, Lord. So I just ask that this morning as we give, you will reward our faithfulness, God, with your presence. You will reward us by being with us in every part of our day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good Sunday morning. I am so glad that you have tuned in to our broadcast. And I got good news for you. We're not going to be in this situation forever. There is light at the end of the tunnel. is coming soon. And I really want to talk to you guys today specifically about having vision. You know, um, when it comes to, to vision and, and believing that there's something at the other end, that, that can be a motivating factor. That can be y your carrot, the thing that draws you, the thing that's like, well, I can do this, I can last, I can survive. Today, I want to share a scripture with you about vision. And it comes from uh, the book of Proverbs, chapter 29. Now, the book of Proverbs, uh, different Proverbs are written different ways. Sometimes uh, Proverbs are longer poems where it's kind of line upon line. Other Proverbs are ones that are just like, here's a random saying, here's another random saying. And they don't necessarily are connected. And that's what Proverbs 29 is like. So Proverbs 29, verse 19 is a statement unto itself. It does not connect it to the rest of the proverb. And it says this, Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained, but happy is he who keeps the law. Now, I want to share this with you this morning. I want to talk to you about what it means to, to have vision. And first, let's pray. God, we thank you for this scripture. We thank you for this proverb. And God, I pray as we read this verse, as we cross-reference with other passages to get understanding for it, I pray you give us vision. Help us to believe for more. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, when I say this word vision, well, you know, let's go, let's go for a walk. When I say vision, uh, what I mean today, uh, I don't mean that like in the corporate sense of the word, like this is our business's uh, vision statement, a purpose statement, whereas that definitely has a place uh, in this thought process. You know, we, we have vision uh, statement here at Fireplace Church, and I'm certainly not against those, but that's not necessarily what this one means. Now, the concept of a vision statement can be found within this passage, certainly, um, but it's not necessarily in the same corporate 10-year plan mindset of this term of vision. This word actually literally means 
uh, revelation. Where there is no revelation, they throw off restraint. Or another translation says, the people perish. You see, revelation has to do with what you're hearing from God, what God is saying. And when it comes to us having a vision statement, when it does come to us having a 10 year plan and you personally having one of those, I, I pray that it doesn't just come from some good ideas. But I pray that it comes from some God ideas. And that's what this passage is referring to. Not just good ideas, not just goals, but literally vision or revelation from God. God speaking to you and giving you plans for the future. Now where the people have no revelation now that we're clearing up that this isn't about people not having a vision statement this is not about people not having goals or 10-year plans this is about people lacking revelation lacking a word from god there's a passage in amos that actually uh refers to a time and a place where people would live without revelation amos chapter 8 verses 11 through 12 say this behold days are co coming declares the lord god when I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread or a thirst for water, but rather for hearing the words of the Lord. People will stagger from sea to sea, north, uh, from the north even to the east. They will go to and fro seeking the word of the Lord, but they will not find it. Now this verse refers to a time period when God was not speaking to Israel. In fact, um, most theologians believe Amos is referring to uh, both the time in particular that he was living in just slightly after that time period when there was going to be a lack of prophetic voice to the people that he was speaking to directly. But he also, they also most theologians believe that refers to a 400 year time period that is referred to as the silent years. It was a 400 years from the time that Malachi prophesied uh, the last chapter of the book of Malachi, which is the last book in the Old Testament, to the 400 years later when John the Baptist shows up on the scene preaching repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Now we know because uh, Israel did not hear from God for 400 years, man, you got to imagine how that would play effects on their spiritual life as a nation. In fact, the very words that Amos uses there describe people going to and fro seeking a word from the Lord sounds similar to some of the language Jesus used to describe the Pharisees in their going to and fro uh, and trying to make converts, but also confusing people all the more. Now, luckily, you and I do not live in that time period. We live in a time period where, man, I've got the Bible. I've got the Spirit of God living inside of me. We've got the prophetic gift. We, we can hear from God. We don't live in a time. We don't live in the silent years. And so, you know, like, well, Pastor Alvin, um, what's this got to do with me then? If, if I don't live during the time that Amos was prophesying about, if I'm, I don't live in a place where Proverbs 29, your main passage, refers to a lack of revelation, we've got lots of revelation. What's this got to do with us? Well, I'm glad you asked. This has to do with us because although you and I do not live in a time period where there is a complete lack of revelation, you and I don't live in a time period where we don't have the word of God. We don't have the prophetic voice. We do not have, you know, we, we, we live in a time period where the spirit of God has taken up dwelling in our mortal being. You and I can voluntarily put ourselves in a place of having a lack of revelation. And you're thinking to yourself, Pastor Alvin, why would I ever do that to myself? And I think the same thing, but yet we do it, right? We, we get so used to living off of yesterday's bread. We get so used to living off what our, our pastor told us, or we get so used to living off what grandma, grandpa, mom told us, whoever else. But we're not going after revelation ourselves. We're not pursuing what the word of God is saying to us. So we must pursue revelation. We must pursue vision, not just goals. Goals are birthed out of a place of revelation. We, we've got to have plans, man. We are making it through this. We're not just going to survive in quarantine, but we have the potential to thrive in quarantine. Uh, I, I believe God can give you some ideas, birth some things in you, teach you some stuff that, man, you're going to grow during quarantine. You're going to come out of quarantine with a new job, a new idea, a new invention. Uh, I, I believe that, man, this, this time period of rest, um, you know, what we talked about last week uh, about the rising up on wings like eagles to, to run and not grow weary, to walk and not faint. Uh, you, here's the thing. Is that verse that we talked about last week, was that about walking and running and flying or was it about waiting? 
both. You, if, if you, man, you're, you're called to run, you're called to, to fly, you're called to walk, you don't get to clap out of the weight. The weight was important. It, it is it's what prepared you for the run, the walk, the fly. So I, I believe during this time of quarantine, you and I are gonna have an incredible opportunity to receive revelation, vision from that, and from a place of hearing from God, then you can begin working on goals, 10-year plans, so on and so forth. So back to our original text. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no vision, the people cast off restraint. Now, I know uh, another translation of the same verse says, that where there is no vision, the people perish. Now, Pastor Alvin, those two words sound extraordinarily different to me, perish and cast off restraint. How did two different groups of Bible translators, one come up with uh, the people perish and the other ones come up with cast off restraint? Well, I'm glad you asked. Well, the Hebrew word there actually contains both ideas, that they would throw off restraint, and therefore, because of the throwing off of restraint, then now the perishing <laughs> has come upon them. So it's not that they're two different words, it's just a more complex word that contains both concepts of both perish and throw off restraint. It reminds me a little bit of the story in the Exodus where Moses left Aaron in charge of the people of God while he was gone. So Moses goes up on the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments from God. And while he's gone, he leaves Aaron in charge, says, hey, Aaron, don't do anything crazy while I'm gone. So Aaron's in charge. He's leading the people of God. And in Exodus 32, verse 1, it says this. Now, when the people saw that Moses delayed from coming down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said, come make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we don't know what has become of him. So at this point, they're like, we don't know what happened to Moses. He went up on the mountain and we don't know whether the wolves got him or what happened, but man, he led us out of Egypt and we don't know what's up. And since Moses was one telling us about Yahweh and brought us out of Egypt, Aaron, you're in charge now, make us a new God. Now what you see they've got going on currently is a lack of vision, like we talked about before, a lack of revelation, a lack of belief that God was going to come through and do the things he said he was going to do. Well, what happens? The very same thing that Proverbs 29 says will happen when you have a lack of revelation. They throw off all restraint. Verse 25 of Exodus 32, as that story continues, as Moses comes down the mountain and sees what's going on, as man, they, they are throwing a party. They, 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 they have begun to worship a golden calf. Verse 25 says, now when Moses saw that the people were out of control, for Aaron had let them get out of control to be a desertion among their enemies. They threw off restraint because they lacked vision. They didn't believe Moses was coming back. And in the long run, this created all kinds of problems for the people of Israel. As they threw off restraint and they began to worship the golden calf and, and not to worship God and God alone, it caused personal destruction in the lives. I encourage you to go back and read the story of Exodus, but it wasn't good. It wasn't good for the people. So what ends up happening is because of a lack of vision, because they didn't believe Moses was coming back, they threw off restraint and, and they began to perish. That, that Hebrew word that encompasses both concepts. Now, once again, what's it got to do with us, right? I would like to bring application to your life right now and your life in general and how this idea of having restraint because of vision and revelation impacts what you do and how what you do impacts who you are and how you live. Now let's first talk about this idea of vision and revelation and how it impacts where we're at right now. Where we're at right now with lockdown, quarantine, whatever you want to call it, stay at home, shelter in place, all the fancy words that they have come up with for, you ain't going nowhere. Look, it's really easy to lose sight of the fact that one day we're going to be out of this. It's really easy to lose sight of the fact that one day we'll go back to life as normal. You'll get to go to your job, you'll get to go to church, you'll get to go to shopping, uh, all the things that we miss doing, going to the beach all that good stuff, we'll go back to that one day. It's really easy to, right now to lose sight of the call of God on your life, the, the things that God has spoken to you and promised you, uh, the, the things that you've been pressing into, your personal ministry. And I always say your ministry, because just because I'm the pastor doesn't mean I'm the only one who has a ministry. We all have ministry, we all have 
callings and purposes on our life. And it's really easy in the middle of this time period to lose sight of your ministry and your calling and what God has said to you. But if you begin to live like you don't have revelation, if you begin to live like you don't have vision, like you don't have a word from God, it gets really easy to throw off restraint. It's easy to, to live very haphazardly like when you don't have to drive to work and have that commute in the morning. You don't have to go to school. You don't have the, the normal activities of life. The joke around our house right now is living on COVID time. There was an old song back in the 80s called Living on Tulsa Time. And then the song was about how when you live in Tulsa, Oklahoma, any Okies in the house say amen. When you live in Tulsa, Oklahoma, uh, you, you live on a different time, a different pace of life. Well, living on COVID time, and it's just a different pace of life. When when do you wake up? When do you take the pajamas off? When do you brush your teeth for the first time? And it's really easy to live a haphazard life when you don't walk as though you have vision for the future, revelation from God, purpose that we're going to get out of this. I want to encourage you, go back, look at some of your old journals. Look at some of the things God has spoken to you. Read some of the promises of your life, scriptural promises, personal promises, the things that you know God has, has been stirring in you and live with purpose in this moment. How can I use this time period? How can I maximize my moment? How can I live in a way that it doesn't look like a life without restraint? How can I live a life that doesn't look like I'm perishing? How can you say, let's take this moment and make the most of it. Now, I wouldn't wish this moment on anybody. This not being able to leave your home and go do things, uh, the, the economic effects this has had on people, people losing their jobs. I wouldn't wish the, uh, the illnesses and, and deaths that have been accrued because of this disease. I, I believe that we can look back on this season and although we wouldn't have wished any of the atrocities of this disease on anybody, we'll also be able to look back and say, Wow, didn't, didn't I grow a lot during this season? There were some things that may have been exposed in my heart. I, I may have had some, some issues and, and some fractures that the pressure of this moment exposed some stuff in my life and I was able to deal with it. Or maybe there was an area of growth that I was able to experience. Maybe it was just, man, you needed a break. You needed a little siesta from all this life uh, of hustle and bustle and you got a little break from things. But I believe we'll be able to look back at this moment and be at least a little bit thankful for it. The last line of this verse says this, but happy is he who keeps the law. You know, when I think of this verse, it almost reminds me of something that, that David said in Psalms chapter one. Psalms one says this, how blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night. He will be like a tree that is firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. Its leaf does not wither, and whatever he does prospers. These words blessed uh, are actually uh, very connected to the word happy. Blessed is he, happy is he, they're almost interchangeable, but uh, this, this has to do with a, a deep level of happiness. It's not just happenstance. It, it is so connected to, man, this, this blessed life of saying, you know what, I, I'm not going to give in to the downward spiral of sin. I'm not going to give in to this unrestrained life that we talked about a moment ago. It, you, you'll notice that there's, there's this downward spiral of the, the, wor the verb walking, standing, and sitting. He, he was walking around it. He was standing in it. Next thing he was sitting in it. He says, blessed is he, blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, stand in the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But then the psalmist in juxtaposition to the downward spiral of sin, saying, blessed are you for avoiding this downward spiral of sin. He said, blessed are you for submitting yourself to a life of devotion. He says, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And he meditates on it day and night. It, are you delighting in his word? We talked about this way back at the beginning of quarantine. And I challenge you guys to delight in his words. So not just, not just a duty-based, a religious-based reading of the word, but actually delighting in what his words say. And the Bible says that when we delight in his word, it says we're like this. He will be like a tree firmly planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season. And his leaf does not wither 
and whatever he does prospers. See, one of the unique things about these river trees, these, these trees along this creek, man, right now we're getting a lot of rain, right? Like, like there, there's no drought happening right now at all. Well, wait till July. In, in July, when it's not just all these spring showers every other day and long torrential downpours, I, I was teasing Jessica the other day about how she did that talk on Noah last week and it has rained all week ever since. But wait till July when all this dries up. And up there on the hill where I was earlier, there's gonna be some trees that are struggling. But these river trees, they are planted. They are planted by water and they will receive water no matter what's happening in the field. When you and I delight in the law of the Lord, when we delight in his word, we, when we are blessed by this lifestyle, we have avoided the life of unrestraint. And we say, you know, we're going to be diligent. We're going to pursue his word and we're going to delight in his word. We're like one of these river trees and we don't have to worry about whether or not we're going to receive. We're going to receive. It doesn't matter uh, what happens at church or what doesn't happen at church. It doesn't matter what happens uh, at work or what doesn't happen at work. If you are delighting in the law of the Lord, you're like these river trees, you will be fed you will be taken care of, you will receive from the Lord, and there's a blessing on the activity of your life. Once again, I want you to live in a place of revelation. I want you to live in a place of having vision, having received from God. Absolutely, have 10-year goals. Absolutely, have plans and vision statements. Man, there, there's a scripture in the book of Thessalonians that I remember reading as an 18-year-old that it jumped off the pages at me. And it has been a guiding principle in my life ever since. And anytime that, that my spiritual life has gotten a little bit wonky or my, my ministry has, I go back to that passage and say, this is revelation to me. This is God, when I was 18 years old, you dropped this scripture in my lap and said, this is the man that I want you to be. I encourage you for this moment and for this life, have revelation. Have wisdom. Hey, get, get a word from God and don't let go. Pursue it with all that you have. If you're not right with God, uh, this life that I'm referring to, this life of, of living without restraint, this life of not having a vision from God, uh, this might be all you know. All you know is, is a life without restraint. You know, the author and perfecter of my faith, the one that I look to for the ultimate example. I love the examples I've quoted to you from King Solomon and King David here. I love the example of, of Moses. I love the example of Amos. But the author and perfecter of my faith is Jesus Christ. He, he was the one that all of these men were pointing to. All the prophets, all of the law, everything pointed to Jesus. And Jesus had a had revelation. He had wisdom from God. He had a word from God, and his word was to go to the cross. His word was to do and say what he saw the Father doing. His word was a life of faithfulness. And in that moment in the garden, when the weight of the sin of the world was upon his mind, when he knew what he was going to be tasked with in the days to come, it would have been really easy for him to cast off restraint to do whatever it was he wanted. He prayed a prayer in the garden one day and he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not my will be done, but your will. He had a moment where he could have cast off restraint. He said, you know what, I, I'm not going to the cross. I'm not dying for all these ungrateful human beings. I, I'm not gonna let the Romans scourge me. I'm not gonna let the, the temple priest punch my face. I'm not gonna wear a crown of thorns. He, he had a moment where he could have made that decision and cast off restraint, but he had vision. He had revelation. He knew what his role was. He knew what God had called him to. And based on the word of God and based on his relationship to the father, he knew I've got to do this and I'm not going to cast off restraint in the moment that people need me the most. Today, if you're a believer, Jesus is the author and perfecter of your faith. Look to him as the ultimate example of somebody who lived with revelation, lived with vision from God and fulfilled the vision of his life. Him going to the cross, I, if, if I have to compare what God has called me to, to that, if he can be faithful to his calling, I can certainly be called, faithful to mine. But if you're not a believer today, I wanted to make sure I take some special time and speak to you. 
say that Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price so that you could be right with him. Today, I want to challenge you. If you're not right with God, you have the incredible opportunity to get right with him right now. You don't have to wait until my church opens back up. You don't have to wait until your church opens back up or the one down the street from where you live. You don't have to wait for the church to open up because guess what? Heaven is always open and Jesus is always forgiving sin. The, the Bible tells us that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin when we repent. Today, if you take the opportunity to ask God to forgive you of your sin, he will. No questions asked. He will forgive you of your sin. And it says that he will forgive us of all unrighteousness. I can stand only as a man of God with the authority of God's word, say that if you have asked him to forgive your sin, he has the big one and the little one, the, 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 the huge gross sin and the little bitty white lie. So if that's you today, you wanna to make sure you're right with God, I'm gonna ask you to pray with me. Pray this with me, if you would. Dear Jesus, come on, go ahead and repeat this out loud with me. Dear Jesus, I thank you for dying for me, for paying a price that I could not pay. And today, I give my whole life to you. Forgive me of my sin Wash me, make me new, empower me with your Holy Spirit to live for you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you just prayed that prayer, I am so excited for you. I want you to get in contact with me, whether you're watching this on social or you're listening to this on ESPN radio, get in contact with me, either through the social that you're watching it on or just email me at pastoralvin at fireplacechurch.com. It's the easiest way to get a hold of me. And just let me know that, that you have invited Jesus to be the Lord of your life and he has forgiven you. Well, the rain is starting to catch up with me. I'm gonna get on out of here. So God bless you and we'll see you next week. Good morning, Fireplace families. Oh, so good to see you guys again. See you guys, you know. <laughs> so today we're going to close out our series that we've been doing about talking about trusting God. So today we're going to learn about a man named Ananias who helped a man named Saul, who then eventually became the Apostle Paul. Now Saul in his lifetime was known for arresting Christians and doing some pretty mean things to them. One day he was on the road to Damascus and he had an encounter with God. Now, God spoke to him from heaven, and there was a bright light shining in his face. And God said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul said, who are you, Lord? And then God revealed to him that he was God, the God of Israel, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And then after this encounter happened, Saul stood up, tried to continue walking to Damascus, but he discovered that he was blind. He couldn't see anything. So the people that were with him had to guide him to Damascus. And when he got there, he was praying and he saw a vision. And then God spoke to Ananias. And this is what he said. He said, go to Saul, go to the street called Straight. And there's a man named Saul who's praying. And Ananias said, Lord, I have heard many reports about this man and all of the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name." Now obviously, Ananias was afraid of Saul. He even said, God, don't make me do this. But because he was obedient, he went. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. 
he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. Now God used the obedience of Ananias to help heal and change Saul's heart. So Saul decided that he was going to spend some time in Damascus with the disciples. Now, if you remember, that would have been completely opposite of anything that Saul would have done before he had his encounter with God. So this next little part I'm gonna read to you is about Saul and what he did after this. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. Everyone that saw and heard what Saul was saying couldn't believe that it was the same man that he had been just a few days earlier. The power of God changed the heart of Saul. And that's a pretty big change that he went through. And God does the same thing for us. When we are sad, when we are lost, God and his power changes our hearts so that we choose him and we follow him and that we choose to love those around us. The primary or first or one of the most common ways that God uses to reach people is through other people. He uses me to speak to you. He uses you to love your friends and your family and to share the name of God with them. He uses missionaries to reach people all over the world that have never heard the name of Jesus. And so there are a few things here that I want you to remember about this. First is that God sometimes uses us to, and pulls us into scary situations. So that could be any amount of things. Sometimes it's a little bit scary when missionaries go across the country or overseas because they have to leave their families behind. And there are sometimes scary situations there because just like how we talked about what Saul did to Christians in his time, there are some countries around the world where it's illegal to follow Jesus. And so they could be arrested there. I mean, for me, even sometimes standing up in front of people and talking is a little bit scary, just like I'm doing right now talking to you guys. But I know that God has called me to this. I know God has called me to lead people in the next generation, like you guys and our fireplace kids and the youth group. And so even though I'm afraid, I still do it. That is what, in my opinion, bravery is. It's doing something even though you're scared. And just to go along with that, the second thing I want you guys to remember is that when you're scared and obedient, God will protect you. So sometimes these scary situations that we get pulled into, called into, that we walk into and have to try to figure out how we're gonna live in even though it's a little bit scary, God's protection is all around you. Now sometimes people do have to get arrested for their faith in Jesus. But whenever that happens, God uses them and uses their faithfulness to him to impact so many people. We read stories about it in the Bible and we hear stories about it in different countries all around the world. That people in prison that love God and choose to continue to praise his name change other people that are in the prison or the guards or anyone else that's around them and watches how they handle their lives. And finally, our obedience changes people's lives. So here we saw that Ananias being obedient to God and going to pray for Saul helped change his heart. You, when you are obedient, can change other people's lives too. And that doesn't mean that you have to share the gospel with everybody to change their lives, but even just loving them and showing people that you care for them can change their lives. So how can you change someone's life? This week, I wanna challenge you to do something kind every single day of the week. Mostly it'll be for your family because you know we're not spending as much time out around people. But I want you to do one kind thing every day. So that could be that you clean your room or your toy room without being asked, that you choose to share. You tell your parents how much you love them and how much they mean to you. Or that you ask your brothers or sisters to play with you. You never know how much one little act of kindness can change someone's entire life. 
So for our craft this morning, there are two things that are included on the PDF for you. One is a coloring page, and the other is an activity sheet. It'll probably be a little bit more difficult for the younger kids, so just keep that in mind. That one also includes a lot of coloring, but they're both on there to help you remember and just get a little glimpse into the story that we talked about today, about how Ananias was obedient and helped change Saul's life. So I'm gonna say a prayer for you guys. God, I just thank you for stories. Lord, I thank you for this time where we get to talk about you and learn about you and share about all of the wonderful things that you have done. This week, I ask that you will prompt us in kindness. God, you will remind us to be kind and loving to those around us, to the people that we spend every day of our lives with. God, that we know, Lord, that we can change people's lives. And I ask for your protection to surround each of us. God, as we walk through our days and through this whole week, God, that you will keep us safe and you will protect us. Lord, I thank you, Father, and I just pray for your presence to be known in every part of our day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you so much for tuning in this Sunday. We are so glad you spent this time with us. We pray that God did amazing things in your life. Feel free to get in contact and let us know what God did in your life this week. God bless you. We'll see you next time.